Okay, so we'll just continue uh, from where we stopped. Um, yeah, so we uh, were looking at uh, let all prophesy the spirit of prophets are subject to the prophets uh, god is not the author of confusion but of peace as in all the churches of the saints uh, and so this is why uh, we want order in the worship when we gather as a church uh, that there be order that uh, things are done in a way that uh, allows uh, allows for things to happen peacefully, that there's no confusion. Uh, all of that is because God himself uh, is a God of order. He doesn't uh, do things in a way that is confusing. Uh, he does things in ways that enable peace. Uh, and so that's how the church uh, should be, how, how our gatherings should be conducted. Uh, verse 34 and 35. Uh, can somebody read that, please? First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34 and 35. Let the old women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are not to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. Thank you. Uh, okay, so yeah, verse 34. Um, let women keep silent in the churches. Uh, so we know earlier in 1 Corinthians 11, 5, uh, Paul talks about women praying and prophesying, and he says they should cover their heads when they are praying or prophesying, because if they uncover it, then they are dishonoring uh, their head. So uh, dishonoring uh, themselves, dishonoring um, their husband by keeping their head uncovered when they are prophesying. So in the same book, this, this is what we mean by looking at other teachings uh, within the same book, right? Uh, so here he's saying women keep silent, but in verse chapter 11, verse 5, he's talking about women praying and prophesying in the church. Uh, so let's understand why he's saying women keep silent. He continues to uh, say more about it. Um, they are not permitted to speak, but should be submissive, as the law says. Um, if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. Uh, so we understand here that he's talking about a husband and wife, because he's saying uh, women keep silent. If they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands. He's not talking about unmarried women. Um, and why is he uh, talking about this? So women were not as educated in the law. They didn't have they didn't have a, a general education, and they didn't have a spiritual education either. Uh, so when they were coming to the church gatherings, their understanding of what was being shared or being taught would be much much less than the male, uh, than the men who were gathered there. Um, and so instead of in that place, starting to ask maybe very basic questions um, that would, uh, would be things that uh, wouldn't be relevant to the rest of the church gathering because uh, where the women were coming from was in a very different place from the rest of the the men gathered there. So instead of them asking their questions in that context, or even trying to ask their husbands questions in the church, uh, because the men and women would be sitting separately. So to ask uh, their questions from where they are sitting, to talk to the men on the other side and ask their questions would be very disruptive. Again, uh, continuing to talk about order in worship. Uh, keeping peace in our gatherings. Uh, so in this context, he's saying, don't talk in church. Don't ask these questions in church. Go home and talk to your husbands and uh, ask your questions when you're at home. Uh, 
Uh, because if you are asking in this context, it's going to be disruptive. It may not be relevant to the gathering. Um, he's not discouraging them coming to the church. He's not discouraging them understanding and growing in their faith. He's only saying, don't do it in the church um, because we want to keep this. Uh, we want to keep a certain level of order and decorum within the church, uh, and and it is not appropriate in this context for you to ask questions that uh, may be irrelevant or to ask questions um, to your husband who is in sitting in another part of the room. Uh, and so he says, for it is shameful for women to speak in the church. Um, so, um, so understanding that this is between, uh, uh, he's talking to a husband and wife. So when you have questions, go home and ask your uh, husbands in the context of your house. Uh, because if you're asking within the church, it will be disruptive to the church. Um, any questions on this? Okay, so um, in this chapter, Paul says he uses this uh, these words "keep silent" three times. Uh, one time is uh, when they are speaking in tongues and there is no one who can interpret. So if there's no one who can interpret, keep silent. Uh, another time he says it is take turns to prophesy. When you finished prophecy, uh, when you finish sharing your prophecy, then keep silent um, so that someone else can share their prophecy. And then the third time is women, if you have questions, keep silent and ask your husbands at home later. So this is not to discourage uh, women preaching or teaching in the church. Uh, the context is very different that uh, what Paul is talking about. Um, it has nothing to do with whether women can preach in church or whether, whether women can teach in church. Um, let's move on from there, verses 36 to 40. Um, when someone read those verses for us, please. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 36. Or did the word of God come originally from you? Or was it you only that it reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. Okay. So he's just uh, reminding them uh, that if you think yourself to be truly spiritually mature, uh, then you uh, can see that what I am sharing uh, is uh, is for the spiritually mature. Uh, and what I'm saying is coming from the Lord himself. Uh, so he's encouraging them to receive what I'm saying as teaching, as wisdom from the Lord. Uh, don't... Uh, don't be stuck in your ways of thinking, in your ways of doing things. Um, um, verse 38, if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. Uh, or on the other hand, it's also translated, if uh, anyone wants to ignore this, let them, they themselves be ignored. Uh, this is similar to what he says um, earlier, knowledge puffs up, right? Uh, but if you love, uh, if you love God, you will be known. So he's saying, uh, don't let your knowledge make you so proud that you're not willing to hear what I have to say. Uh, if if you ignore what I have to say, then you yourself will be ignored. Uh, rather, pay attention and um, 
then he goes into verse 39 desire earnestly to prophesy do not forbid to speak with tongues so uh, here just to make sure that they've understood he's not saying don't speak in tongues right uh, either in the church gathering or in your personal time don't forbid the speaking in tongues but speak in tongues with the right order so he says verse 42 let all things be done decently and in order Uh, we can move into chapter 15. Uh, would someone read verses 1 to 8, please? Yes, sir. Um, can you just explain 36 again? Uh, whom it signifies and what's the meaning of it? Or did the word of God originate? Are you the only people it has reached? Um, this, is, um, this is just to tell them that you are not the uh the source of god's word or you're not the only people who know god's word so don't be in a place of spiritual pride where you're unwilling to receive um receive what i'm saying so if anyone thinks they are a prophet or otherwise gifted by this will let them acknowledge that i'm right what i'm writing to you is the lord's command so to say that uh, what I'm teaching you is coming from the Lord. Don't feel like uh, you already know everything that uh, God says or uh, you already have complete knowledge uh, and don't need what don't need to hear what I am saying. Uh, so what I'm saying is also coming from God. And if you have the spirit of God, then you will understand that this is of the Lord also. Um, so uh, just to help them uh, be receptive to what he's saying as um, as authoritative from God uh, and as God's will for the church gathering. So this is not uh, to be taken lightly. Uh, it is important that when we gather, uh, we are following a certain way of doing things. Um, so yeah, he's just kind of giving... Uh, reiterating that this is from God, not just a human word. Does that make sense? Still unclear? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so chapter 15, uh, verses 1 to 8. Can somebody read that for us, please? Yes. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 to 8. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to be present, but some have fallen asleep. But after that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. Thank you. So here he's, uh, he's finished this whole section on um, order in worship and order in our church gatherings. And now he's moving into a new, um, a new topic that he wanted to address with the Corinthians, uh, which is... Uh, their understanding regarding the resurrection from the dead. Uh, and he'll continue to talk about this in the rest of the chapter. Uh, so he's starting with a reminder of what was the gospel. Uh, so the, the first thing that he had declared to them was the gospel itself. Uh, and that is the gospel which saved them. Uh, that is the gospel that they had believed. Uh, and that's a gospel on which even at present they continue to uh, remain. Uh, so he's reminding them of what are the truths of that gospel. Um, 
So uh, verse 3, Christ died for, your, for our sins, according to the scriptures, uh, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. So that is the core of the gospel. Christ died, was buried, and he rose again. Uh, and if, if they don't hold on to that core teaching uh, that was preached to them, then their faith is... Uh, is going to be useless uh, so hold fast he's saying uh, keep secure hold keep a uh, firm position possession on that truth that was preached to you don't let go of it um, so uh, there will be uh, he's he's implying two things here that there are enemies or influences that will try and take away this truth from us uh, and uh, the other side of it is, if we let go of the truth, then we have believed in vain. So even if we at one point did believe in it, if we let go of it, then our uh, faith will have what we believed at one time will have no effect. That means just because we believed before, uh, now if we've let go of it, it doesn't mean that we can still be confident of our salvation. We have to keep holding on to the truth of the gospel, we keep uh, believing in the truth that Jesus died for our sins, uh, that uh, Jesus rose again, and in that is our hope of salvation. Um, and then from there, uh, he goes on to um, verse 5 to 8. Uh, so the proof of Jesus's resurrection uh, is undisputable, right? He was seen by uh, Peter. He was seen by the uh, the rest of the disciples. He was seen by over five hundred other uh, believers who had come to the Lord, um, and most of them at that time, when Paul was writing this letter, uh, were still alive. Uh, this is something that actually. Yeah, he's writing it as very important for them to know at this time, the Corinthian church, but also even for us, um, when people, when it's questioned, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Uh, how can we believe uh, the Bible, what's written in the, in the New Testament specifically, uh, is that there were so many witnesses to Jesus's resurrection. It cannot be even questioned whether it really happened. Uh, anything uh, today, if it's, it goes to the court of law and there were so many witnesses like we have here, uh, it would go to judgment without any question because so many witnesses were present. The other point of it is that when the New Testament was being written, so many of those witnesses were still alive. And so if the disciples, uh, if Paul was writing things that were untrue about Jesus, uh, they were writing uh, things that had not happened, these witnesses could easily um, have brought that up and could have come against what was being written. But because what they were saying was true, the fact that all of these people who were alive during Jesus's ministry were also uh, were also standing with what was being said in the New Testament, in the Gospels, uh, means that they were saying what is true. They were uh, truly recording what Jesus had done. They were truly recording what Jesus had said, had taught and uh, these witnesses were proof of what was being said. Uh, they had also seen Jesus say those things, they had also seen Jesus do those things. Um, yeah, so, so basically in these first few verses he is talking about the resurrection of Jesus uh, being a very core belief for the church uh, and uh, that the resurrection cannot be disputed. There was there were so many witnesses, and those witnesses were even alive at the time of this writing. Uh, and so 
if the Corinthian church was in any way unsure about Jesus' resurrection, they could go to those witnesses and talk to those people who are still alive. Um, we go on from there, uh, verses 9 uh, to 11. Can somebody read that for us, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9 to 11. For I am the least of the apostles, who I am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preached, and so you believed. So he just goes into a brief um, description of his own role as an apostle. So he was not one of the first 12, uh, but he was someone that God chose later. And um, so in humility, he recognizes uh, that he, he is not one of the greatest apostles. On the other hand, he's one of the, he's the least. Um, and he recognizes uh, his, that he himself was against the church, was persecuting the church. Uh, but only the grace of God is what saved him. And that grace had such a great effect on him uh, because he recognized how unworthy he was of that grace, uh, that it pushed him to work harder than the rest of the apostles. Uh, so uh, that is something for us as well. Why is the gospel so core uh, for us as believers even now? Like, whether we've been believers for three years or 10 years or however long we've been believers, uh, the gospel and the grace of God in the gospel is so important because that, when we remember um, that it is only by grace, only by grace that we have been saved, uh, that grace should push us to a place of uh, giving our all for God, for sacrificing uh, as uh, sacrificing our everything for the sake of Christ. Um, and so to see that grace have effect on our lives, to push us to a place of serving, of sacrifice, uh, of giving our all for God. Um, and But even in that, he realized, recognizes that it is God's grace, even in that. So I pushed harder than the rest of the apostles, but it was God's grace with me, uh, even in that, uh, that enabled me to work so hard. Um, and then he says, uh, but whatever we did, we all preached the same gospel. So whether it was them or uh, me, uh, we all preached and we preached the same gospel and this is the gospel that you believed as a church. Um, let's go on from there, verses 12 onwards. Uh, can someone read verses 12 to 19, please? First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 to 19. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not risen. But if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not raise. For if the dead do not raise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then... Also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men, the most pitiable. Okay, so here he's coming to the core issue that uh, he wants to address within the church. Uh, some of them are saying that there is no resurrection of the dead. So uh, somehow that teaching had come in or that conversation or discussion had come into the church that there is no resurrection of the dead. And so he wants to address 
this wrong thinking within the church, uh, wrong understanding within the church, uh, which is why he starts this whole thing with, this is the gospel that we preach to you. The gospel that you believed was that Jesus died, that he was buried, and he, he was raised from the dead. That is what saved you. That is what is keeping you standing now. Um, but now if you are saying there's no resurrection of the dead, then you're denying that gospel itself. You're denying that Jesus was raised from the dead. Because if Jesus was raised from the dead, then that means there's resurrection for everyone. But if there's no resurrection for everyone, the opposite is also true, that Jesus was never raised. Um, uh, but he's already said that there were witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. I myself saw it. The disciples saw it. 500 other believers saw it. Uh, and so it is indisputable that Jesus came back from the dead. Jesus was raised from the dead, which means that resurrection for the dead, uh, of the dead, is available to all of us as well. Um, verse 14 If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Uh, so um, more than that, we have found to be false witnesses of God, about God, uh, for we've testified that God raised him. So uh, he's saying, if in fact Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then our testimony to you was something that was false, because we told you that Jesus did rise from the dead. Um, verse 16, if the dead are not raised, Christ has not been raised either. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Uh, because this is what the resurrection is. Right? The resurrection gives us a hope that uh, we too will be raised. And we will be raised uh, alive in Christ. We'll be dead to sin, alive in Christ. Uh, but if you're saying that Christ has not been raised, that means you are still in your sins. There is no hope that you uh, can live a life um, that um, that is free from sin and death. Christ's resurrection shows that Christ overcame sin and death, uh, that he paid the price for our sin, and he has given us victory both over sin and death. Uh, and so uh, if you're saying Christ didn't rise, that means that hope of life free from sin, a life free from uh, death, does not exist for us as believers. Uh, so this is why uh, keeping the truth of the gospel, keeping the truth of uh, that core of the gospel is so important. If you let it go, that means you're letting go of that hope of uh, victory over sin and victory over death uh, for Christ himself and for us as believers. Um, uh, verse 18, uh, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. So if uh, all of these sacrifices, all of the suffering that we are doing in hope that there is an eternal glory for us. Uh, if there is no eternal glory and all we have is this life, then why are we suffering the way we are suffering? Why are we? Uh, Paul talked about his own suffering as an apostle right? in the previous chapters. Uh, he talks about all that they have given up uh, for the sake of the gospel because they believe in this eternal. Uh, reward that is ours, and that eternal reward is Christ himself. Uh, and so it's worth all of the sacrifices that they are making uh, for the sake of the church, right? So that more people will come to Christ. And uh, even for their own sakes, that because they believe that there is a reward that is so much greater uh, than this life at present. But if all we're living for is these, this present life on earth, then why are we suffering the way we're suffering? Why are we doing all the things we're doing? We are we are the most pitiable of men if this is this is all there is. If we are going to just suffer and uh, and then that's all there is to life. Um, 
and then he goes on from there, verse 20 to 28. Um, will someone read that, please, verse? Um, verse 22. 28. Okay. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 to 28. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father. Then he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For me, we must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now, when all things are subject to him, then the Son of then the Son Himself will also subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Thank you. So uh so christ's resurrection he was like the first fruit what is the first fruit uh the first fruit is uh the first or the beginning of the harvest right so when you get the first harvest that beginning harvest it's a guarantee that the rest of the harvest is going to start after this um and so Jesus was like that first fruit, the first one raised from the dead. And is he acts as that assurance that the others following him will also be raised from the dead. Um, since by man came death, by man also came resurrection of the dead. So because death came through Adam, there had to be another man who lived who would bring life, who would bring resurrection, and that came through Christ. Uh, in Adam all die, but in Christ all will be made alive. Uh, and so Christ is, is the first fruits of that new creation. Uh, and so our hope is in Christ, in that resurrection. Um, but each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards those who are Christ at his coming. Uh, so when Christ returns, those who are in Christ, uh, those who died in Christ will be made alive first. Uh, so there will be order even in this, uh, in uh, the second coming of Christ, in the resurrection of the dead, there will be an order that is followed. Um, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. He uh, he puts an end to all rule, all authority, all power, but he will reign till he puts all enemies under his feet and the last enemy to be destroyed will be death. Uh, so this is talking about the uh, millennial reign of Christ when all enemies will be brought uh, under his feet. Uh, and Verse 27, he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things, it doesn't mean God the Father. So uh, Christ himself has submitted himself willingly to the Father. And the Father has put all things under the feet of Christ. He's given Jesus this place of authority, uh, of power. He's given him uh, this reign and this rule. And so God himself, God the Father himself, will not be subject to Jesus, uh, but all other things will be subject to Jesus. Uh, and then Jesus himself will give uh, all things over to the Father, will put all things uh, under the Father's authority, that the Father himself will be all in all. Um, So we move on from there, verses 29 to 34. 
Um, will someone read that for us? Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for, for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boosting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die do not be deceived evil company corrupts good habits awake to righteousness and do not sin for some do not have the knowledge of god i speak this to your shame amen, amen. thank you so uh in verse 29 paul is talking about a practice of people who were baptized for the dead. Uh, now, it is not clear where that was being practiced. Uh, it is not that he is saying this is something that we should do uh, in the church, uh, but he's just using that as an example that people itself, uh, we believe that uh, there is a life after this. Uh, there's a natural belief within us, uh, like he says um, elsewhere, um, God has placed eternity in the hearts of people. That is a natural belief that exists within people, that there is more to life uh, than, uh, than just this present life. And uh, so he's using that example of uh, that, the, the fact that there is more uh, to life, that there is a resurrection. People have this faith within them. Uh, in verse 30, he says, what about we ourselves? We are giving everything. We are sacrificing so much, like I talked about earlier, his own examples uh, from his life of all that he sacrificed for Christ. Uh, he's giving his life daily uh, for uh, for Christ in this faith that there is more. But if there isn't more, then why should we do all these things? Why should we make these kinds of sacrifices? Uh, why should we? So in verse 32, he's saying, I fought the beasts at Ephesus. So uh, in the church in Ephesians, he had made so much sacrifice. And, uh, and this is where he's writing this letter from. Uh, but what advantage is it to me if at the end of it, we're all going to just die? We might as well just eat and drink and uh, die, right? Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so he says, uh, verse 33, do not be deceived, evil company corrupts good habits. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, I'll just try and finish us off. Um, so he says, yeah, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness. So he's saying don't surround yourselves with people who are um, promoting this false teaching because you will be deceived and then you'll start 
to <laughs> live the way they are teaching, uh, which is, yeah, just live for this life. Um, forget about eternity. Forget about uh, forget about what is coming. Just live this life as if there is nothing else. Um, if you are living in that way, then you will not uh, you will not make any sacrifices for Christ. Uh, you will you'll just start to live as if the present is all there is. Um, and then verse thirty four. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So that's just a concluding statement uh, to everything that he's been saying so far. Um, OK. Um, so we can move on from there. Uh, verses 35 to 49. I don't know if we actually have time to go into all of this. Um, maybe we'll just stop here and we'll continue. Uh, so I will try to do the video tomorrow and post it uh, for the rest of this chapter and chapter 16 and see if I can start a little bit on 2 Corinthians as well. Um, yeah, we'll close. <laughs>